if you're if you're the Titans, do you really want to rely on Will Levis to win this thing for you? Don't you want to hand the ball off to Derrick Henry and try to win that way, Chelsea? No, you don't, because that has not been working. I think this yeah. is the thing for the Titans. You're playing with nothing to lose. They have already mm-hmm. proven that they're not in it to win it this year. Like, I'm surprised they didn't trade away Derrick Henry, but they did trade away some other pieces. I think at this point, you let the guy throw the ball down the field like you did in the first game. Because if they were going to be conservative with Will Levis, wouldn't they have done this in the first game? Like, you're playing with nothing to lose. This is a Titans team that, you know, they have a pretty low ceiling. So I think at this point, you try to develop Will Levis as much Mm -hmm. as you possibly can can and it just opens up the offense so much when you can throw the ball down the field but if you do like the under i think the the factor here is he's not always going to complete those downfield passes like we saw four of those in his first game those are not high percentage throws that sometimes cannot be replicated so i think that's where you know maybe there's some volatility with the total there it's not that necessarily i think the titans are going to be conservative with will levis it's just some of those that he so some of those throws that he completed in his first week were not high percentage throws do you get what i'm getting at yes no i know exactly what you're saying so i and that's going to be if you're facing the steelers i i think that that that's the way to beat the steelers if you're on the titan side I think what you want to do is set up Will Levis where he's not trying to force the ball on a third and long, right? You set him up for a third and short, and that way the Titans have options. Maybe that opens up D-hop down the field. You can take a shot if you need it. But putting a young quarterback in a situation where he's constantly in a third and long is a recipe for disaster. That's when the Steelers will feast. So I think that's – You've got to open up the passing game, but you got to put Will Levis in situations where he can throw the ball and not have to force it on a third and long. Let's look at the matchup and see if we can find some other ways to play this because I feel like I'm pretty torn on a side and a total Mm because, I, like I said, there's so much volatility when it comes to Will Levis. I think on the Titans side of the ball, you can possibly attack the Steelers secondary. The number one is going to be out Minka Fitzpatrick for this game. And also, they have been pretty terrible against number one receivers. If you listen to some of these number one receivers and their numbers against the Steelers, Nico Collins mm-hmm. for the Texans, 168. Devontae Adams, 172. Amari Cooper, uh, 90 yards. Brandon Ayuk, 129 yards. Puka Nakua, 154. And then just last week, we saw the Jaguars have three receivers with 70-plus receiving yards. Granted, they have Trevor Lawrence, who is a huge step up from Will Levis, But when you look at DeAndre Hopkins, his number is 52 and a half receiving yards. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty low number for somebody who has hit over 100 receiving yards multiple times this season. And clearly, he's going to be the security blanket for Will Levis. He's the guy that made all of those electric catches for Will Levis in his debut. So I think if you're going to play a prop on the Titans side, Mm -hmm. it has to be DeAndre Hopkins. Oh, I love that. I love that a lot. And actually, one of my handicaps, it's the only prop that I like in this game. He's hit the number in three of his last four games. And you mentioned Fitzpatrick being out. This just feels like a low number to me. Doesn't 53 and a half, Mm -hmm. just if you're just glancing at this number, you say that it just stands out as I feel like DeAndre Hopkins, even in a low scoring game, could get 60, 70 yards easy. I know that's not a real deep handicap, but sometimes a number jumps off the page to you and 53 and a half seems way low to me. Number 12, Missouri at number two, Georgia. Georgia opened as a 16 and a half point favorite. Little money coming on Mizzou. Now it's dogs laying 15 and a half with the total set at 54 and a half. What are you thinking? Upset alert. Upset alert. Ooh. Upset alert. What? Yes. Whoa. Missouri's. Wee, wee, wee. Don't forget last year. <laughs> Thank you for the siren, Chelsea. <laughs> That's exactly what the upset alert should sound like. Woo, <laughs> woo. Nailed uh, it. It's so, beautiful. Don't forget, last year, Missouri put a hell of a scare into Georgia, right? Like, it was down. Now, that's in Columbia. This is this is between the hedges. I understand it's a very different animal. But how many times have we watched Georgia drag our gambling hearts through the mud for a half of football? Sometimes an entire game. Like, they are... 0 4 and 1 against the spread when they've got at least a 15 and a half point spread this year. 
They have not been covering big spreads. They have been struggling in first halves. And Missouri, five wins in seven games against the spread this year. I think they they, they definitely cover. I think you talk about uncomfortably close. This is going to be one where Georgia, again, is going to have to wake up in the fourth quarter to put Missouri away. But if they're not careful and they don't, put the hammer down when they get an opportunity to in the second half. Yes. Upset alert. Keep an eye out on this This is one of those ones where you will get the alert, the upset alert on your phone. When this thing gets to about (laughs) seven minutes left in the fourth quarter, like we all do. And you go, Oh man, you know, Missouri down by three in the fourth quarter. Can they pull it off? And you'll flip over if you're not already watching it to CBS to see if they can pull it off. They definitely cover 15 and a half. You know what else sounds good? College basketball starting in less Mm. than a week. It looks like next week we have college hoops kicking off. And we know you cover the ACC. You go to the media day. So do you have a play for us on a team maybe to look out for in ACC basketball? Yeah, last week was ACC Basketball Media Day, and as part of my job here in in Virginia, I was able to interview a bunch of the players and coaches and things like that and get some, you know, some insider information, not necessarily insider information, but some good information by asking the right questions to these players and coaches. And look, you know, for the ACC championship, and the irony of this is I can't make this bet because we're not allowed to bet on our state schools here in Virginia, a foolish rule if you ask me. Um, I think UVA at uh, plus 700 is, is the value to win the ACC. Look, Duke is the most talented team. There's no doubt about that. Uh, North Carolina, I just don't believe necessarily in their roster. Miami has a lot of veterans back, and Coach L is – probably one or two in this conference in terms of best coaches. But if he's not the best, I think Tony Bennett's the best. And UVA has so much talent coming in. You know, in the previous years, their offense has been an issue, and they haven't scored enough, and they've relied on their defense. I don't think that's going to be an issue this year with some of the kids that they brought in. The Andrew Rowdy kid from from St. Thomas, who I really liked at St. Thomas, he's going to flourish. Reese Beekman, of course, got his NBA draft information and now is back with the Cavaliers. They play that pack line defense. And here's the better thing. Virginia's going to start out slow because the, the players have to learn the pack line defense and, and, and they got to learn the blocker mover offense. But I think they're going to pick things up come conference time and I think they're going to be a threat. And I don't usually take favorites when it comes to winning conferences. So UVA at fourth at seven to one to win the ACC. I think the value is there for the Cavaliers to be your ACC champion this coming season. Matt, before we let you go, we got a couple minutes here. I'm curious as someone who really gets into the weeds in college basketball, and you're already starting right now on the show, how much prep have you already done for the upcoming season, just getting ready for it? Uh, I think it's good early on. I think there's some value early on in these games where mm-hmm. nobody knows anything because the thing is, you know returning starters, you know coaches, you know styles and things like that. So I feel like there's some value in some of these underdogs. Now, you're going to notice in a lot of these early games this first week with the higher-up teams playing the lower-up teams, there's either going to be close results or the higher-up team is going to win by 50. So there is the opportunity for value, but there is also the opportunity to have some of your worst losses for the season. You know, you may take a team who's a 10 point underdog they may lose by 30 and that may never happen again the rest of the season because of how much or how little everybody knows about these teams so just kind of studying the coaches the players the returning starters and things like that early situations is there a large game in in the second game that maybe the team's not paying attention as much in the first game so just trying to find some angles for this slate that has a lot of poor games but maybe some potential value as well